Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Okay, so I, I am here to moderate, I mean, to be the moderator for a talk uh, given by uh, Stephen uh, Tuzart, I mean, about results that I found very interesting. So before we really uh, go into the talk itself, I mean, I, I like to present a few bio facts about uh, Stephen. Okay, Stephen graduated from the Ecole Normale Supérieure Cachan, uh, now called ENS uh, Paris-Saclay in France in, two, in 2013. In fact, it turns out that it's also my alma mater. Okay. After one year as an exchange student, he started a PhD in the group of Professor Michel Devoré at the Yale University in 2014. And he defended his PhD titled Stabilization of Bosonic Codes in Superconducting Circuits in June 19, 2029. Uh, in 19, sorry. His PhD work focused on developing new control, uh, new quantum um, control methods for superconducting qubits and uh, resulted in novel measurement and quantum error correction schemes. Okay. So after his PhD, I mean, Stephen joined the group of Travis Nicholson at CQT uh, last uh, summer in 2019, where he works now on quantum information with single neutral uh, strontium uh, atoms. Okay, so today, uh, Stephen will talk about his work at Yale, about, I mean, quantum error correction of a qubit encoded in the grid states of an oscillator. So before I leave him the, the floor, um, I would like uh, maybe uh, that if you have questions, okay, maybe you can just uh, interact, okay, because I'm not sure that I will always have a look at the, the message box, uh, okay, so you just interrupt uh, Stephen to, to ask a question. I think it will be more dynamic in this way, unless uh, people have objections. Okay, Stephen, is it fine with you? Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the, my screen. If I use, you did. Okay, so now, I mean, please, I mean, uh, Stephen, welcome, and and uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Christian. Christian, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the organizers at CQT for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this uh, these results. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, quantum error correction, and more precisely about. Uh, quantum error correction uh, in, where the logical qubit is encoded in an oscillator. So this work has been done uh, with a team of uh, great people that are listed here. And in particular, I worked uh, full time on the experiment with uh, Philippe Compagnie Bar, who is now uh, working in Paris, and with Alec Agbouche, who is still a graduate student uh, at Yale with Michel Devoré, uh, finishing his, uh, his PhD. So um, first I will motivate and uh, introduce this, uh, this talk. Um, the, main, um, the main motivation for this talk is uh, to find a way to go towards making uh, useful quantum computers. So the state of quantum computing is, is uh, sometimes described on the, this graph where the x-axis is the number of uh, physical qubits in the quantum computer. So roughly the size of the Hilbert space that, uh, that can be accessed with the quantum computer. And on the y-axis is the number of gates between uh, these, uh, these qubits. Um, so the fidelity with which you can uh, move within this large Hilbert space before losing coherence. Uh, today, we in the, the bottom left corner, uh, in what is sometimes referred to as the noise intermediate scale quantum uh, era, the NISC era, as uh, 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 coined by John Preskill. And the goal is to move in the top right corner where a quantum computer would be able to solve real problems, real problems with a real interest uh, with a speed up. So for example, factorization, uh, search algorithm, chemistry simulations, etc. cetera. And uh, for now, so between these two, these two regions, there, uh, there is a, a blank, a white region where uh, there is the, uh, some kind of limit called the quantum advantage where what we can uh, do with a quantum computer cannot be simulated with a classical machine, but uh, where it can also not solve any practical problem as far as we know. So those, uh, those areas are likely to move. And for now, the state of the art is roughly here where the, the numbers are given as orders of magnitude and not uh, really uh, uh, exact, right? Uh, and it's been reached by uh, uh, Google, like uh, as you as you could see in their um, quantum supremacy uh, paper. So, how do we reach this um, this uh, re this uh, red uh, area? So, um, what is currently limiting the uh, quantum computing uh, is the errors that uh, that uh, that um, uh, happen with within the the quantum computer. So, if I represent roughly 
in the way that the Google's quantum processor looks like. You have a certain number of qubits represented by those uh, black uh, dots. Uh, and usually the state of a qubit can be represented with a block vector on the block sphere, for example, here. Uh, and uh, this uh, quantum processor is um, controlled and measured using control lines that are uh, the arms sticking out of, uh, of the processor itself. And within this processor and from the, the control lines, there is some uh, environmental, environmental noise um, that is represented here in red that will change the state of, uh, of the physical qubit. And so this noise is, current, is what limits uh, our uh, ability to do uh, quantum computing. So uh, we cannot run those uh, advanced algorithms. So what, there are several things that we can do uh, to solve this problem. One, we can find algorithms with a lower requirement, and that's an active uh, area of research. Or we can also find a strategy to have better qubits. And this is this latter strategy that we will uh, that we follow in this work. In particular, we do so by using quantum error correction. So what is uh, quantum error correction? We can define it as an asymptotic way to mitigate errors in, uh, in qubits. So asymptotic here, what I mean is that by using more and more resources that are already available, uh, we find a way to stack them together in order to mitigate errors more and more. So, uh, and I will describe how we do this. So first, we, we uh, modeled our environment with a certain number of uh, possible uh, errors that it will, co that it will cause uh, by interacting with physical qubits. And we make a list of the ones we want to, uh, to mitigate. So it will be given by some operators, E0, E1, et cetera. And they can be caused by a noisy electromagnetic field, energy dissipation, and many other causes. On the physical qubit, these uh, error operators, they modify the, the state of the physical qubit. And once this is done, it's, it cannot be changed. It's, uh, the, the information is, starts being, uh, being lost. And the more you wait, the more it will be lost. So our strategy for error correction is to embed a logical qubit, so a qubit that we now call logical, uh, into a larger Hilbert space. And uh, the reason to do this is such that uh, this within this encoding, when one of the operator uh, is applied to uh, to, the, to the logical qubit, instead of changing its state, it projects it to a new error uh, subspace. So for example, if purple error here happens, and it projects it into, uh, into this uh, purple uh, subspace, then the same for orange, et cetera, for the, for the whole list. And it needs to do the, se to do the same kind of uh, uh, projection onto a new, a new space uh, for both the logical zero and logical one. And if it does so, the, this this uh, projection happens without modifying the information that is encoded into the, the into the logical qubit. So the block, block vector is preserved. And from the point of view of the quantum processor, uh, we don't know what error happened. So what happens is that we end up in a statistical mixture of all these errors having happened. So to complete quantum error correction, we need yes. Yeah, so this this uh, this criterion is sometimes referred as the Neil Laflamme criterion. Um, what we, do to comp what we need to complete this uh, quantum error correction is to have access to the measurement of some operators that are called stabilizers, a uh, full list of them, SA, SB, et cetera, where the outcome of uh, the total measurement of all these operators indicate what error happens. So for example, uh, let's say it indicates that error two happened. In that case, we will end up in a pure state uh, given by this orange state here. And all the other ones will uh, now be, uh, we, we know that they, they, they haven't happened, or depending on your interpretation of quantum mechanics. So they, they haven't happened. And uh, what we can do is we know where we are, we're in this orange subspace, and we can uh, either stay there if it's, uh, if it's fine, or we can apply a transformation to go back to our initial logical qubit. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, roadmap, uh, one possibility is to scale the number of qubits that we have right now to a large number of them. We group them into physical, uh, we group the physical qubits together uh, into a larger Hilbert space, and uh, we use them to do uh, quantum error correction and to transform them into better logical qubits, and that brings us into the, the red area. So this strategy that I will refer, that I refer to as register of many two-level systems is the strategy behind some uh, famous codes, quantum error correction codes, like the Shor code, the surface code, the color code, 
which are used uh, in, uh, in various fields. But the problem that arises with, uh, with this, uh, this register of many two-level systems is uh, can you scale them correctly? So you need a huge number of them. And uh, so for each, each one, each time you add a two-level system, you need a control system. You need to control uh, them. So that's more electronics, et cetera. Uh, you need to, uh, for, for superconducting circuits, you might have a crowded chip, et cetera, et cetera. To give you an idea, it would need uh, many uh, hundreds of, of thousands of them. And in the recent IBM roadmap, they, they think that within two to three years, they, they might be able to reach a thousand. So we're still uh, quite far away from, uh, from having a fully uh, quantum error corrected quantum computer. And on top of that, something that is common to all quantum error correction codes is that you add new failure modes. So every time you add a new qubit, you add a new way for your quantum computer to fail. And uh, uh, one of the points that you have to uh, pass is you need to your quantum error correction to be better than one of your physical qubits. And, and after that, you need to make it even better than that until you can reach this uh, 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 quantum error corrected uh, quantum computer. This point where you're better than one of your physical qubits, we sometimes refer to it as break even. And this point for registers of two, two level systems has not been uh, obtained. And so far, as far as I know, the, the closest people have been is a demonstration of a small surface code in, uh, uh, published recently from uh, Andreas Walraff's group at ETH Zurich. Our strategy is to use the Hilbert space of a single harmonic oscillator, which is a larger Hilbert space, um, in order to encode the logical qubit. So this, the, this strategy has uh, some, uh, uh, boson they are called bosonic codes, and they can be cat codes, binomial codes, and the one we're interested in today is called the GKP code. So uh, similarly to the register of many two-level system, you introduce new failure modes because you, add, you, you use more excitations of uh, more and more excitations of a single harmonic oscillator. But uh, because you're using a single harmonic oscillator, it's easier to manage. And this uh, uh, break-even has been reached for cat codes and binomial codes uh, at Yale in 20, a few years ago and uh, from at Tsinghua by uh, Yale alumni, alumni uh, using the binomial code. But, um, uh, and so, yeah, th this approach uh, is, uh, is easier to handle uh, now and uh, in academic labs because it's hardware efficient. When you, uh, even if you increase the number of excitations that you use in a single harmonic oscillator, you don't need to uh, uh, scale your electronics at room temperature. So that's, that's uh, an interesting point. And another one is, uh, uh, so one of the things that uh, limits uh, the, despite going to break even those two papers, they didn't have a possible fault tolerant control of, uh, of the, the encoded qubit, which is an important part, which means that when you control the encoded qubit, you can, uh, any error in your control can also be corrected by your quantum error correction. So that's also something I will discuss a bit throughout the talk. So our goal is to do quantum error correction with uh, the um, with the harmonic oscillator, and so uh, it means using continuous variables. So this large Hilbert space for us can be described in terms of uh, phase space of um, of an harmonic oscillator, uh, where Q and P are two conjugate variables uh, that uh, correspond to uh, operators that I give on the right, where I use the uh, quantum optics uh, convention. Uh, and uh, those two operators give you two different bases uh, in which you can describe your, your code. So I will now describe what is this, uh, this JKP, GKP code that we used, which uh, stands for Godesman, Kitayev, and, uh, and Preskill. So uh, before describing exactly this code, we need to make a, a crucial remark, which is that any error that happens within an harmonic oscillator can be expanded as, uh, as small shifts. So I will not demonstrate that, but I will show you an, uh, uh, an interesting example that illustrates this problem, I mean, this, this, uh, this, this point. If you encode, uh, for example, if your harmonic oscillator is um, the mode of, uh, of a cavity, like uh, schematically represented on the right, and that this, uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, this mode here can lose photons with a rate kappa. So to model this, uh, we use an error operator where uh, you have a probability within an interval dt 
to lose a photon uh, with probability kappa dt. Uh, and losing a photon here would mean applying the operator A. At small times, when dt is small, you can expand this, uh, this operator into uh, four, these four exponentials that depend on q and uh, np, the conjugate variables. And these exponentials, uh, each one of them is a displacement operator that here I can define uh, like this. So what it means is that this, uh, I can do an expansion where uh, at small times, uh, a photon loss can be represented as a superposition of those four displacements. So because we can do this with, uh, with all physically uh, possible error channels in, uh, in our um, uh, harmonic oscillator, the only thing that I need to do is to construct a code that, is, uh, that resists to, uh, to shift. So uh, I will show this uh, code proposed by Kodesman, Kitayev, and Preskill 20 years ago. And uh, I will just describe how the quantum error correction uh, works. So the code itself, uh, the logical 0 and log logical 1, I represent their wave function as a function of, um, of a position. And they are infinite superposition of, uh, of Dirac, so of uh, perfectly peaked distributions. Uh, so a Dirac comb, that I represent a few peaks here. Um, they have a, period, a periodicity, a period delta Q, and uh, the zero, for example, will be centered in, uh, at zero, and the uh, one uh, will be offset by half a period. So as long as I have a position shift that is inferior to uh, half the period, this, uh, it will only uh, correspond to a change of origin. I will not uh, mistake zero for one and vice versa. And if I look at this, uh, the, the wave function of these uh, states in the, in the momentum basis, you can see that it's the same. A momentum shift will on, only be a shift of origin. And another additional thing that you can notice is that I have a gate that will transform 0 into 1 by simply applying a position displacement of a half a period. You can see it with the first representation. And this uh, gate is fault tolerant because if I have a small error in my gate, uh, over displacement or under displacement, it will correspond to a small shift, which is exactly what this code is meant to prevent. Now, this, uh, this protection here, uh, not being able to mistake 0 for 1, etc., is uh, protection against bit flip. And what is nice with this code is that if I look at, uh, at its, the um, symmetric and anti-symmetric superpositions of 0 and 1 by adding or subtracting the wave function. Uh, you can see both in position and uh, momentum basis that they have the exact same property. So on top of being protected against bit flip, this code also protects against phase flips. So it's a fully protected qubit. The periodicity for um, in, the, in the momentum basis is uh, 2 pi over delta q. So if I want this, period, this period to be the same for uh, 0 and 1 and for their uh, superpositions, I will have to choose uh, delta q such that it is uh, square root of 2 pi. Then I have equal protection against bit flip and phase flips. And from the representation of plus and minus states, you can see that I also have a fault tolerant z gate that is a displacement in momentum by, uh, by half, a, half a period. And uh, uh, it's pretty incredible, but with these uh, x and z, you can create uh, uh, Pauli y, and they follow exactly the Pauli uh, group algebra. So the problem is that those uh, infinite superposition of infinitely squeezed, squeezed states, they are unphysical. They cannot be made uh, like this, so it's a theoretical description. But uh, something that is great is that by simply using superpositions of squeezed states, uh, with the Gauss overall Gaussian envelope, I have pretty much the, the exact same properties, as long as the squeezing is, uh, is large enough that two uh, peaks uh, that are next to each other don't overlap. Uh, in that case, I, have, I don't have a significant overlap, and, uh, and I have a well-defined qubit. So now I will describe, uh, we see that uh, these, uh, these, this code uh, is uh, correspond to our description of uh, the Neil Laflamme criterion, but I also need to describe what are the stabilizers that we can use to, uh, to correct uh, uh, errors. So for this, I will go back to this perfect uh, ideal representation because it's pretty similar to how it works with the, the uh, non-ideal representation. And I'll start in position with the representation of zero and one. 
And uh, uh, what I need is an operator that does not distinguish between zero and one when I measure it, otherwise it would destroy my uh, quantum information, but it reveals a shift unambiguously. And if I measure this uh, cosine here that, uh, uh, and this uh, sine, you can see they have, the, uh, they have a period that is half the period of the code such that they peak, for example, the cosine peaks uh, both, both when, um, when uh, at peaks corresponding to zero and to one, uh, you can see that if they shift, they will, uh, they will uh, have the, the two criteria, criteria that I described. Usually we group them together in this uh, complex superposition and we call this the stabilizer, for example, A. Uh, and it is exactly a displacement of square root of two pi in, uh, in, uh, uh, along the imaginary axis where the displacement is, the, is defined here. Um, so let's see how this works. So I have this ideal state. Uh, now, when dissipation acts, it uh, creates those stochastic position shifts. Uh, I don't know which one happened, but uh, if it shifts more than half a period, I will have lost some quantum information. Uh, so it looks like a, like a, um, a, a diffusion process. Now I, I, uh, apply, I will measure this cos and this uh, and this sine, and uh, the result of this measurement, because S A is a unitary, will give me a complex value. Uh, Eigen, eigen um, value uh, given with modu modulus one, so this exponential i theta, and uh, it will project the the state that I just measured into back to one of these uh, ideal states, but uh, but shifted. And knowing the the value of theta, I will know exactly what is this shift, and I can correct it and recenter it uh, with uh, with feedback. The same thing needs to be done in the momentum basis. So there is a second stabilizer, SB. So I will now give a summary of this, uh, the properties of the GKP code uh, and give maybe uh, maybe more uh, mathematical description. So uh, we have uh, Pauli operators that are displacements that I described uh, before, X, y, uh, y, and Z. And uh, the GKP states can be described as the common eigenstate of the, the stabilizers SA and SB. Uh, for each eigenvalue, they have two uh, eigen, eigenstates, eigenvectors. Those two uh, stabilizers commute, so you can measure one without disturbing the other. And each one of them commute with uh, the Pauli operators, such that when you measure them, you don't destroy the quantum information that is encoded in your logical qubits. The thing that might sound weird to um, most people at this point is that you, uh, how do you measure a displacement? A displacement is actually not even an observable, it's a unitary. So uh, I will answer this question. And uh, the answer is that you need to use conditional displacements. Uh, conditional displacements do everything for the GKP code. So we call them the Swiss Army knife of GKP codes. In particular, you use conditional displacements of uh, the uh, mode that, that hosts your, the, the GKP code uh, with a two-level system. To describe this, uh, I will look, we will look at the uh, pulse sequence that we apply between an ancillary two-level system initialized in G, in green, and what I call the storage mode, which is uh, the harmonic oscillator that uh, uh, hosts our GKP. Yeah, I start by uh, initializing the two-level system uh, on, its on the equator of its block sphere with a pi over two pulse. And then I have this displacement by um, uh, complex parameter alpha tilde. Uh, and uh, this displacement is, is conditioned on the state of the ancillary to two-level system. So if it's in G, it's displaced in one direction. If it's in E, it's displaced in the other direction. And here, because we are on the equator of the block sphere uh, in both directions at the same time. So you end up with an entangled state. And uh, the converse of this conditional displacement is uh, a rotation of the blocks, block vector of the, the ancillary two-level system that is conditioned on the quadrature of the, the storage mode. And so after this conditional displacement, you end up having uh, the, av the expectation value of sigma x and sigma y that are given that give the, the cos and the sign uh, parameterized by alpha tilde. If you sum, if you do the complex sum of sigma x and sigma y, you have uh, exactly the expectation value of a displacement. And to measure uh, this uh, sigma x and sigma y, you will you finish your sequence with a pi over two pulse around the x or y axis, and you measure sigma z of your uh, ancillary qubits. This um, 
so alpha tilde is a complex parameter. So you, you get a 2D map if you uh, vary the, the value of alpha tilde. And this 2D map, given by the expectation of a displacement operator, is actually a known function. It's called the symmetric characteristic function. And it's, uh, it fully represents the state of, your, of uh, uh, an harmonic oscillator. It's not very used experimentally, but it is the Fourier transform of a much widely used uh, Wigner function. It is a 2D and complex Fourier transform. A few points on this uh, characteristic function are of particular interest for GKP codes. So for example, the ones located at square root of two pi on the real and imaginary axis give you the expectation values of your stabilizers. And uh, the ones uh, at half of these values give you the expectation values of your power, uh, logical power operators. So uh, this, this, this conditional displacement, it's something that has been explored before in, uh, in different platforms. So in superconducting circuits, for example, uh, that's something that I looked into before and that's what drawn me to, uh, to this experiment. And it's something that has been done also in the group of your fan Siddiqui, for example, at, uh, at uh, Berkeley. But not only in superconducting circuits, it's also something that can be done in other platforms, for example, in ions. Uh, you can uh, check this uh, work that uh, includes GKP uh, by uh, Christoph Ruhmann at uh, ETH Zurich um, in the group of Jonathan Holm. And uh, I believe it's also something that Mitri uh, works on here at, uh, at CQT. So on average, we have mapped the statistics of a displacement onto a two-level system. But there is a problem. Every time we measure uh, the, the, the state of the qubit, we will only get a binary outcome. When the uh, eigenvalue that we are supposed to get from our stabilizer, for example, is a continuous variable. So uh, if we wanted to have the, the full uh, continuous variable, we would have to extract it bit by bit by repeating this measurement many times. And it's something that has been suggested as a way to create GKP states in this paper by Barbara Terrell and Daniel Wagen at uh, Delft a few years ago. The problem is that it's, it's actually very hard to implement experimentally. So we developed a protocol that I will describe now that, uh, that, is, that was easier to, uh, to implement and that is still very powerful. So let's go back to our description of an ideal GKP state in the position basis here. And uh, we have our uh, cosine and sine that, uh, that uh, ideally we would like to measure. Um, what we do, instead of uh, measuring the, both the cosine and the sine, we will only measure the imaginary part of the stabilizer, so the sine part, and we get a binary result. So let's see uh, how this, so it is a partial measurement of this stabilizer. Uh, and let's see how it impacts the, 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 uh, our quantum error correction. So like before, we have our dissipation and we have this dissipation, uh, this stochastic uh, shift, this diffusion process kind of, uh, that uh, spreads and um, the peaks and we put them in a statistical mixture. And now we have done our binary measurement. We end up with a, a plus one, for example. Uh, plus one tells us that the peaks uh, actually moved a little bit where the sign uh, has a positive value. So this tells us here that the peaks have moved rather to the left. So the back action of this measurement projects uh, the, the state of the harmonic oscillator more towards the left with uh, some, some spread. Uh, and uh, with the, uh, if we have this result, we will uh, trigger a kick to the right to recenter this distribution. And if, uh, if we, the result of the measurement is minus one, it means that the state has rather shifted where the sign is minus one, so to the right, and uh, this will trigger a kick to the left. Overall, we will have peaks that are now sharper than just after the dissipation with still some, some uh, spread. And they will be centered around uh, attractor points that are at the zero of the sign with the, the, the correct slope. Uh, so to summarize this, uh, this stabilization protocol, uh, here we have our first step that I just described, which we call a sharpening of the Q peaks. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, measurement triggers a uh, kickback uh, by a value uh, plus or minus epsilon, uh, where epsilon is first optimized numerically and then optimized in experiment uh, in order to give the best quantum error correction possible. Uh, and then after this step, we reset our transmon ready to, uh, for other measurements. And then it is followed by a step uh, that I don't have uh, much time to describe in, uh, in this talk, but which consists in trimming the, the overall envelope of, uh, of the entire GKP state. 
The goal of this is to limit the extent of the state uh, voluntarily uh, uh, in order to not have it uh, 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 spread over the, the entire phase space. Uh, this is uh, vital for, for the decoherence. It stays uh, roughly in the middle and with a, 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 a squeezing amount that we, that we choose, that we can choose. If you want more details about this, uh, this step, you can refer to, uh, you can ask questions or refer to the, to the paper, for example. And uh, those two steps uh, are done uh, exactly the same in the momentum, um, in the momentum uh, direction to, this way we correct along two non-collinear um, direction and we have, we can correct any, uh, any shift in phase space. So now let's have a look at the experimental setup that we use to um, uh, implement this, uh, this protocol. So our implementation is in uh, uh, 3D circuit QED, so a superconducting circuit, and 3D because we use these, uh, these uh, cavities which are uh, extruded blocks of aluminum uh, with a, like you have a top down view on the left and a side cut on the, on the right with a post in the middle that is roughly 1 cm uh, uh, tall. Um, and uh, those, uh, the reason why we choose this is because those posts act as a lambda over four type of resonator where the field is concentrated in a region which is purely vacuum and doesn't have, uh, doesn't have uh, uh, seams of where you close your box. So this results in a very high, Q, uh, high internal quality factor cavities um, and uh, they are our architecture of choice uh, at Yale, and you can learn more about them uh, in this paper from uh, Matt Rager in uh, uh, Rob's group, Rob, Rob Shalkov's group. Um, in particular, in our implementation, we use a high quality factor one in red that is uh, undercoupled to a pin that we use to do uh, displacement and, uh, and such, um, and that stores the, the GKP state. And in the, they are joined together, those two cavities, by a, a transmon schematically represented in, in green on a sapphire wafer, which is a basic uh, superconducting circuit uh, qubit, uh, which is our two-level ancilla here, and uh, that bridges those two cavities that will be used to do conditional displacement. And the state of this transmon is read using an overcoupled cavity uh, that has a low quality factor because of this overcoupling to a pin. Uh, that we use to read the states of, uh, of the, the transmon qubit. To give you some orders of magnitude, the, the transmon ancilla has an energy lifetime of 50 microseconds, which is uh, fairly standard in, uh, in the field, and the coherence time given by T2 echo of 60 microseconds, which is the relevant uh, coherence lifetime here. And the state of the transmon can be read in 700 nanoseconds, which is uh, much lower than the uh, energy re relaxation of the transmon, and so allows uh, high fidelity and high, highly quantum non-demolition measurements. Our storage cavity has a lifetime of 245 microseconds, which is uh, a bit, um, it's not exactly the state of the art, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very decent. Uh, and this, so it is the single photon lifetime, and this is kind of the, our benchmark to evaluate how well our uh, quantum error correction works. Uh, we usually compare the lifetime of the logical qubit to the single photon lifetime. And for the experts uh, uh, here, they are coupled by a dispersive shift of 28 kilohertz, which is actually quite small uh, in, uh, in this field. They are uh, not very coupled, and that's on purpose. That's to not induce too much anomalicity inside the, the uh, high Q uh, cavity. Uh, despite this, uh, this um, Despite this, uh, this uh, low coupling, we managed to find a way to do conditional displacements uh, very quickly in 1.1 microsecond. I will not describe uh, how here, but you can ask me and you can uh, look at it in, uh, in, our, uh, in our paper. Uh, and uh, together with the fast readout, it allows to do the measure, the, the, this partial stabilizer measurement uh, much faster than the relaxation time of the transmon and much faster than the, the storage uh, lifetime. And uh, to give you uh, an idea, any displacement and uh, ancilla gate times, they take of order 10 of nanoseconds. So it's really negligible compared to, uh, to the rest. Uh, let's now look at, uh, at our experimental results. So, uh, ah, yes, so sorry, w one more point that I wanted to uh, make about this, uh, this architecture is that this is the architecture that we use at Yale, but it is really just because that's what we, that's the, the usual architecture we work with, but it is not necessary to use this architecture. Anything that has 
a two-level system coupled to a uh, to um, an, uh, an oscillator can be uh, can do the exact same thing. So, uh, for example, uh, it can be done. It's been done in uh, in uh, trapped ions, as I mentioned before. Uh, it can be done also in cold atoms and in many other um, uh, platforms. And also, using these particular cavities that are pretty big uh, is not a prerequisite. You can miniaturize those cavities. They are work going uh, going in, in that direction. You can also use uh, uh, 2D defined cavities. Uh, there, are, there are many different systems you can use, uh, but this is uh, the, the architecture for this particular experiment. So let's look at the results that we, uh, that we obtained. So um, I, I will describe these experiments with a, a time sequence at the top. Uh, and the first one that we did is uh, we tried to uh, converge to, uh, to bring our storage cavity into the, the, the code space, the GKP code space. For this, uh, we start our cavity in vacuum, but we can start from any arbitrary state, really. And uh, we turn on our stabilization for uh, n steps where n can be uh, varied. And at the end, we look at the, the value, the expectation value of our stabilizers A and B. And over time, we see that we go from a zero stabilizer value to a finite stabilizer value in approximately 40 microseconds. Uh, we see this uh, uh, sawtooth pattern due to the fact that uh, we alternate four different types of, um, of, uh, of measure of, me of uh, four different steps. And uh, while we do one, uh, the other one will be affected by dissipation and vice versa. Um, if we were to uh, make an infinitely spread and, um, and uh, perfectly squeeze GKP state, we would reach one. But as I said, it's not necessary to reach one to, uh, to have formula correction. In fact, we have optimized with the, the, the envelope trimming state that I described, this value of the stabilizer, uh, because such that this value is optimal for uh, the, the dissipation rate of our experiment. So it, this can be changed if you have a more favorable uh, dissipation rate versus uh, uh, measurement rates. In the second step, what we do is instead of just looking at the stabilizer value, we look at the whole characteristic function. So here is how it looks. So uh, uh, one thing that you can see is that there is this um, uh, grid pattern that uh, emerges that is characteristic of, uh, um, of uh, GKP states. And uh, in particular, because you have uh, Gaussian uh, superposition of Gaussian states in the overall Gaussian envelope, the, this characteristic function is very similar to uh, the Wigner function because it is its Fourier transform, which is preserved for the for those states. The few points that are of interest in uh, in this graph are the uh, SA and SB, which have uh, uh, which have a peak value as indicated by the left uh, diagram, uh, and um, and uh, you can see that where we uh, at the points that correspond to measuring the logical x, y, and z. We have zero because we have converged to uh, a purely mixed state of any possible state within the, the code manifold. Now, uh, from this, we can initialize our logical qubit in, uh, in an arbitrary basis state uh, by, uh, and demonstrate that we have access to projective measurements. So we will measure uh, a logical Pauli. And based on the result of these measurements, uh, apply a, a feedback gate in order to prepare deterministically one of the two basis states of, uh, of the GKP code. Um, and so, for example, here we will do this for the logical Z with the sequence that I described uh, just be below. And, that, and I will show the characteristic function of, uh, of this, uh, this state. Uh, here is what we get. So you can see that where before we had a zero value where Z is, now we have a minus one which shows that with this uh, feedback measure, with this uh, feedback, we have deterministically prepared um, uh, the, the logical one state by applying the, the, the X gate when we get zero, uh, we always get uh, the one state. Uh, we can replace this measurement by a measurement of logical Y and uh, we get a Y state where now it's uh, where uh, I pointed at uh, logical Y that we have a minus one value. Uh, for quantum error correction, one thing that we that are of interest is how long the is the lifetime of the logical qubit. So to show how, to show this, we first prepare basis states, uh, eigenstates of x, y, and 
uh, or Z. And uh, first, what we do as a benchmark is that we just wait and uh, measure the value of, uh, after a certain time, of X, Y, and Z. Without stabilization, you can see that uh, from a final value, the, the value of the, the, the power lead decay in uh, approximately 250 microseconds, we have absolutely no coherence left within the, within the qubit. Um, now, if I replace this wait time by uh, our stabilization, what happens is that we extend the lifetime of, uh, of this uh, logical qubit. And you can see that this extension is very well uh, reproduced by our uh, numerical simulation. So the decay time of uh, the X and Z component is 275 microseconds uh, and the Y component 156 microseconds. So it's uh, slightly, it's, it's, it's a bit below the, the, the single photon lifetime 250 microseconds. Uh, but I, I would argue that this, uh, this uh, comparing this to, this to the lifetime of the cavity, which in itself is not a qubit, right? It's, uh, it's an harmonic oscillator, is not exactly, uh, exactly fair. Uh, this um, this uh, logical qubit is still, uh, uh, much, it's, it's, it's still much longer lived than most physical qubits that are made, uh, at least in superconducting circuits. And it, especially if it's compared to the time it takes to, to uh, do a gate, which is approximately 10, uh, nanoseconds. And also an important part is that these gates are uh, uh, fault tolerant. So that's, that's an important, that's something that to keep in mind to have a fair comparison, uh, to have a fair comparison here. Um, one thing that you can notice is that the, the lifetime of uh, Y is much lower than, uh, than the other ones. And it's not a surprise. It's actually something that you can see our simulations reproduce. So why is that? Uh, the reason is the following. I, I represent the, um, uh, the geometry of our, uh, of our code in phase space with uh, vectors that correspond to the operators uh, of our stabilizers and the logical uh, power Lee operators. The uh, stabilizers form a square uh, with that and enclose an area of, uh, of two pi. Uh, that's uh, one of the reasons why they commute and have two eigenstates for each eigenvalue. And the Pauli operators form um, a square with area that is a quarter of that. Now, if you look at the uh, displacement that corresponds to a, a logical YL, you can see that it is in the diagonal of the square. And so it's square root of two lo uh, longer, which means that an eigenstate of Y has correlations over, uh, over a longer, uh, over a longer uh, distance. And that's why the Y component decays faster. But uh, having this square grid is not exactly a requirement. What is important is to have two non-collinear stabilizers that enclose this area of two pi uh, and to define the, the power Lee accordingly. So I can actually deform uh, this, uh, this geometry in order to now have um, uh, a 120 degree angle between uh, the two stabilizers and uh, still enclosing an area two pi and uh, de by defining the, the Pauli operators X, Y, and Z like this, I still have the same uh, Pauli group uh, uh, algebra, but now X, Y, and Z correspond to displacements of the same length. And the only price to pay for this is that the length of the displacements are now 7% um, longer than, uh, than they were in the case of the square grid. And you can do this with, uh, with any, uh, any angle. And for completeness here, I give the, the expression for uh, the logical X, Y, and Z. The, uh, we can re reproduce the exact same type of experiments that we did with the square code, with the, our uh, now hexagonal code due to this 120 degree uh, angle. If, when we uh, uh, do this convergence to the manifold and end, end up with a, a mixed state, we have uh, the characteristic function that looks uh, like this where uh, we have this exact, you can see this hexagonal pattern that emerges. Um, so just um, uh, a detail is that we, in our stabilization sequence, we now uh, use three stabilizers that also commute with one another and with the different parallels as more for coding convenience and for uh, the, the symmetry, it was, it was easier to do. Um, and you can see that where the logical X, Y, and Z uh, uh, R, we have a zero value, which shows that we're in a mixed state. And um, uh, we can also initialize uh, our logical qubit in uh, uh, states one and, uh, and uh, eigenstate of, uh, of Y with uh, eigenvalue minus one. So 
they look uh, something, uh, something like this. And now if we do the same experiment to look at the lifetime of uh, the hexagonal um, the, uh, code, you can see that the decay time is now uh, isotropic uh, along the three directions. And they, they are given by a decay time of 205 microseconds, which is a very good uh, logical qubit here. Um, so that leads me to my uh, conclusion. So in this talk, I showed that uh, we can correct for arbitrary, we have presented a code that can correct for arbitrary errors uh, within the uh, harmonic oscillator. Uh, that it has fault tolerant uh, Clifford gates, and that you can uh, implement it in practice, uh, and that you get uh, a logical qubit that is better than uh, than your physical uh, qubit. In um, in the, as perspectives, some stuff to do in the future, uh, we can uh, accelerate. We can make faster conditional displacements uh, by using other techniques uh, and use state of the art cavities, which would give us a much faster stabilization rate compared to the lifetime of uh, of the cavity. Um, for example, by using a conditional displacement that I introduced in a, in a previous paper. Um, another very interesting um, uh, direction of research is to do the, uh, the, the error correction, the same protocol, but where the ancilla is now a uh, so-called noise-biased qubit, uh, which means that it's, uh, it's protected, but only in one uh, either bit flip or face flip, for example. Uh, and this is important because uh, the noise, the, the limit on our lifetime, on the lifetime of our uh, logical qubit, is mainly due to errors propagating from the qubit to the, to the, uh, to, to the, the harmonic oscillator, to the ancilla, to the harmonic oscillator. And um, there are only one type of errors that, uh, that, that will be um, uh, transferred to the logical qubit, and those are bit flip errors. So if you can suppress them, for example, using uh, the so-called stabilized CAD codes that uh, you know have been uh, introduced uh, at Yale and uh, recently uh, uh, researched in uh, in many other uh, labs. Uh, for example, you can look at uh, those uh, references that uh, talk about this subject. You will be able to do a, a fault tolerant uh, encoding and measurement, etc. So that's a very interesting uh, uh, direction for this research. Um, and another one is uh, you can implement two qubit gates between GKP logical qubits as uh, by using techniques that have been developed before in the, uh, the work of uh, Yvonne Gao when she was uh, at Yale. She's now a professor at uh, uh, NUS and, uh, and CQT here in Singapore, where she uh, demonstrated operations between, uh, between uh, two cavities. And these would also be fault tolerant for GKP qubits. And uh, finally, another one that I didn't add in, into my conclusion, but if you're interested, those GKP codes, it's also something that uh, are used in uh, intrinsically um, protected uh, qubits. So it's superconducting qubits that are where they use the, the intrinsic variables like current and charge uh, together with the GKP codes to, uh, to make a, an ideal qubit. It's uh, some work that is pretty recent, but they are starting to show pro promises uh, experimentally. And um, that's also a very interesting thing uh, to read. And I also invite you to read about the details that I haven't been able to show uh, in, the, in this talk and are in the paper. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate now uh, or uh, later if you, if you want. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Stephen, for this interesting talk. Okay, so now we, we open the session to, to questions. So please, I mean, just uh, intervene, okay? No questions? No. Everyone is shy? Well, let me first uh, starting with uh, one or two questions myself. I'm not an expert, I mean, in this field, okay? I, I just, uh, uh, so what is, I mean, uh, how much do you increase, I mean, the, so say, the lifetime? You gain a factor of what, two, three? Uh, no, I, I think it's much more than that. So the one of, sorry, one of the problem is that uh, the, one of the problem is that the, um, uh, the curve is not exactly exponential, it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly exponential, so it's hard to, uh, to, um, to give uh, a good uh, estimate of, the, of this, but if you have a complete decoherence in 250 microseconds, mm -hmm. um, you, just, you can divide this by, uh, by five, right? 
-hmm. and uh, that gives you like you know five like in five kappa type of uh, decay, uh, and that gives you roughly uh, um, a decay time of um, of uh, fifty microseconds, so close to your physical qubit here, our physical mm -hmm. uh, ancilla. So you can say it's uh, multiplied by four or five. Okay, multiplied by four or five. Oh, okay, and uh, um, so this is limited anyway by the by the lifetime in the cavity, right? Uh, so it's it's both. So it's both. Uh, there are two limitations that you need to balance. Uh, one of them will be given by the lifetime over over how fast you can measure. Uh, so if you can measure faster uh, compared to the lifetime, that's good. The problem is that if you measure too much. Uh, the, at each measurement, measurement um, at each uh, measurement step, the transmon is uh, gets entangled with uh, with your cavity. Mm -hmm. uh, your qubit gets entangled with your your ancilla gets entangled with your uh, cavity, and this can cause uh, logical errors. So you want uh, to balance the errors coming from uh, from this uh, this ancilla to level, ancillary to level system. Um, with uh, the, the fact that the, the cavity has a finite lifetime. So you can optimize this uh, in, uh, inside your experiment. Uh, so you can play on the, the two fronts. You can either uh, have a qubit that uh, induces less errors uh, or physical qubit, or you can have your uh, cavity to live longer. So the state of the art right now uh, in our field is like a lifetime, like the four uh, four to uh, ten times longer than uh, than what we we've made, um, so that can be also uh, one possibility. But the the most promising way is to find um, an ancillary that doesn't because uh, at some point you, you in all these cases you reach a top, uh, you, you reach a limit. So the 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 most promising uh, way to uh, to to go is to find a way to do a fault tolerant measurement of your um, uh, of your error syndromes. So to do this, you need, uh, you need your uh, ancillary uh, qubits to also be somewhat corrected. That's, that's uh, Okay, yeah, I see. Okay, okay. I, I, my second question is about, I mean, this kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, lattice network structure that you have, and you, you mentioned that you can do something hexagonal, right? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so, the, um, so, but these type of lattices are in solid state physics, what we, we would call, I mean, brave lattices, okay? So, have the people explored, uh, or is it even a sensical question, I mean, to explore other type of uh, lattices? Uh, for example, I'm thinking of the honeycomb lattice, obviously, uh, which has, I mean, two sites in a cell. So, I don't know if it, it would be worse or there would be feature that you can use. I don't know. Uh, so, I... So I'm, I'm not sure how different it is from our, uh, uh, for the honeycomb, for example, how different it is from our uh, hexagonal. Uh, so one thing that is important is those uh, states are named after um, uh, Goldsman, Kitaev, and Preskill because they showed their potential in, um, in uh, quantum error correction. But uh, some people had noticed before that uh, uh, those, using those, uh, uh, those uh, periodic structures would give you the possibility to measure commuting variables, uh, commuting operators that involve position and momentum, um, uh, despite the fact that position and momentums are not supposed to be measurable at the same time. So for example, Aronoff uh, noticed that. And I think there is another um, uh, researcher, but I can't remember his name, it's uh, Zay or something like this, uh, the, who noticed that in, uh, in solid states uh, a long time ago, those commutation relations. And uh, so uh, uh, there was an article recently in uh, Nature Physics that was calling those states after the, those uh, uh, research in solid states. So it's definitely, I, I'm not sure if it's inspired from the point of view of, okay. uh, of Goldsman, Kitaev, and Preskill, but it's definitely something that is uh, connected to, uh, to, uh, to solid states. Okay. okay, thank you. So any other questions, please? <laughs> Don't be shy. I'm sure there is a lot of questions, in fact. So anyways, if you, uh, if you don't ask them now, you shouldn't hesitate to, uh, to contact me uh, uh, to ask them. And also, uh, I think this um, will be put on, uh, online. So if anybody watches this online later, they can also contact me without 
I will try to answer to my best. Uh, I do have uh, one question. Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> so you mentioned that all, all of the, your studies were on um, um, using the optical family setup. Um, are there any immediate differences? You, you said it could be generalized easily to other types of qubits. Are there any immediate differences in uh, in the experimental outcomes of applying the procedure to other systems? So I, I cannot hear you too well. So I believe that the question is about when I when I said uh, that. Uh, that uh, our particular experimental platform here, that it's not necessary to have uh, this, that it's not necessary to be within this field. Is that correct? Yes, you, you said that. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> uh, my question is, would the performance uh, of uh, the procedure vary significantly for other uh, practical implementations? Yes, so, so for Sorry. example, um, uh, so, in, uh, as I mentioned, there is some research and like the, the first uh, uh, synthesis of GKP states uh, has actually been done with uh, ions where the uh, GKP is, uh, state is in the emotional degree of freedom. Uh, and that also has been published in Nature uh, in 2019. It's a brilliant work. Uh, so they definitely have the capability to do so because they can do um, uh, conditional displacements. And uh, their emotional degree of freedom is, uh, is quite coherent. Uh, the conditional displacement is relatively fast, probably comparable to, uh, to ours in terms of uh, ratios of orders of magnitude. Uh, one of the prime that they have, and that I think they are working on correcting, is that when you measure, uh, so the two level system in this case is the electronic degree of freedom of your ion. Uh, and this would be the same, for example, with cold atoms. And in this case, uh, the prime is that when you measure the electronic degree of freedom, uh, you use fluorescence, which uh, scatters a lot of uh, photons, and this uh, heats your emotional degrees of freedom and destroys the, the GKP state that you did. So even if they could uh, synthesize it, it had to be, um, uh, it couldn't be deterministic uh, because it involves measurements uh, and, uh, and that one measurement uh, scatters photons and what the other doesn't, meaning that it doesn't, didn't uh, absorb any uh, state selective fluorescence. Um, so their measurement is not non is not quantum non demolition. So that was their main uh, their their main uh, limitation, uh, and I believe that they are working on that uh, by um, using uh, some kind of um, um, autonomous way to do so, where you don't need to read the measurement. You just need to uh, to to you just need to remove the entropy from uh, from the system. Uh, this uh, would be similar if you use uh, trapped, uh, trapped uh, ad uh, neutral atoms, uh, which would be quite interesting. Uh, but you would have the same problem with uh, fluorescence. And uh, in other platforms um, that, uh, that I could uh, uh, think of, it hasn't been tried, for example, nanomechanics and, and such, but uh, there is no, no reason. And then there is the other thing within this field, if you were to miniaturize, uh, to miniaturize those cavities, uh, maybe the lifetime would be, uh, uh, so we manage, there is research within Rob Sholkov's group to miniaturize these precise cavities, um, kind of the same principle. Uh, and in this case, it's not necessarily, you would, you would have actually a better lifetime than what we had in this particular experiment. So a similar outcome um, and, uh, or even better. And uh, I think, uh, you know, by making all the timescales uh, faster, uh, including your, um, uh, the control electronics, you could uh, have, for example, a worse cavity that would still multiply uh, uh, its lifetime by, uh, by many times and still with fast control, etc. cetera. You. And uh, if you had, if you go with the way that I mentioned at the very end, in my conclusion with uh, those uh, already uh, have corrected uh, uh, quantum, uh, quantum bits. Uh, in that case, uh, in, in theory, you, you know, there is no, uh, there is no limit. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the principle of this fault tolerance is that it's asymptotic as, as much as you correct your uh, noise bias tensile, you will have better results in your measurement. And so you will, you can get uh, as good as possible uh, logical qubits.
Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Uh, listen, if not, then uh, we just have to thank, I mean, uh, Stephen for the nice talk. And uh, as he said, I mean, at least for the people present uh, at CQT, I mean, he's uh, working in Travis Group, so you can find him easily. And I believe the other people you just can contact him, okay, about his, his work. Okay, so I mean, uh, thank you all and see you next time for a security online seminar. Thank you.